am back in the woods, headed out to do uh, what I do. Fish are still at bam. Uh, but on my way out, I saw this big tree, which I thought was interesting. I might be the only nerd you know who is like into trees and rocks and crap, but uh, for anyone else who might be, uh, I like to share stuff like this. Look at this big giant tree here. And, you know, for the record, that's a maple tree, I think, of some kind. Possibly oak, maybe. Maybe it's an oak. It's, that tree, as uh, straight as it is, and, uh, it's probably worth about $2,000 just as it stands. Lumber-wise, it's probably worth $15,000 after they turn it into, like, you know, two-by-fours and things like that. It's a $15,000 piece of wood right there. It's leaning over, though, so that's straight. And look at that thing. So it's been growing that way for a long time. So it's very strong. And the oaks have deep roots. They're known for their deep roots. But it's hollowed out. Uh, clearly somebody took a poop in there one time or two recently. And it's cracked. And that tree's going to go over soon. And when it does, it's going to crash, smash, and land right in the road over there. Hopefully nobody's standing there when it happens. But uh, just thought that was an interesting Fun fact is what they call those widow makers. Uh, you don't want to be under that thing when it goes, trust me, because it'll make your wife a widow. So here's the river. There's usually no fish in this sec section, but it's always worth looking at because you just never know. I mean, sometimes I've never seen a fish in this section. But like I said, you never know. You could walk up right here, look down. There's one little hole right up here where like two little creeks connect uh, to, to each other. And that is uh, always a good, when you call it a confluence, there is always a good opportunity where fish will stage or set up there. Um, the river's down which is good, but we did have some rain. So I kind of half expected that the river would be up. But isn't it beautiful? I mean, talk about a beautiful setting. Then people wonder why I go do this all the time. It's 25 minutes from my house. And that's where sometimes you could have a fish sitting right there. Problem is it's not gravel bottom, it's all rock, cobblestone. So, if it was gravel right there, you'd surely have a spawning set of fish, but you don't, so we're going this way. But like I said, if you live here 20 minutes away, this is how you go recharge your battery. You get outside and you, dude, my, my freaking balls are smashed. It's hot out right now. It's like 75 degrees. I can't believe how warm it is. It's crazy. Anyways, we're on the lookout for some fish and uh, whether we see some or we don't, doesn't matter. What matters is that we're here. We're enjoying the world, we're enjoying life, enjoying God's beauty. At some point I'll stop and I'll pray for 10, 20, 30 minutes and just pray to God for direction and peace, happiness for me, my friends, my family, loved ones, the world. And hope that uh, everybody who sees this will be inspired to get out and. Go do something like this. Trust me when I tell you. It's uh, recharging to your soul. Especially when you look in this little creek and you look down. And there's a big old 10, 15 pound fish sitting there. And you catch it. That's the rush. That's the icing on the cape. That's the cap it off. All right, I'm out. We're looking for fish. Well, I'm headed over to my other spot. No fish there. The water's really low. Any steelhead that were in there. Um, surely backed out and went downstream to the deeper water. It's it's not worth trying to even get to the deeper water because there's so much to get through and it's a very high probability that the fish just left the river. They just left this part of the river. Now they can back out of this little creek and go into the main river, which is much deeper. It's where they probably are. That's where I'm going. And the interesting part about that was as I was walking along, I bump into this old couple who are probably in their late 50s, you know, and uh, nice people and anyways they're christians and i told them you know go check out conviction radio my our radio station and they're like oh i'm really excited and they didn't know what they're doing they had no idea what they're doing they're like well we're here trying to check out some trout i'm like 
would, if you don't mind, would you mind me giving you a quick tutorial on how to catch trout? You know, because I'm kind of the master. I have been paid and offered to be paid for to take people trout fishing because I, I catch a lot of big trout and I know what I'm doing. Years experience, practice, research, whatever. So I like it was cool because they had like a big bobber on there and a split shot. I like, first of all take that that bobber off. She's like, okay, but then I got a split. I said, I'll take the split shot off, and they're like, what? I said, yeah, you won't want nothing but a worm. That makes it natural. So as the worm floats down the river, it looks like it's a naturally floating worm down the river like any other worm. If you put a split shot on there, the split shot and now is snagging on the bottom and the worm's going, stopping, going, stopping. Something doesn't look right. And the trout are aware of it. They are cogent. They are able to discern, wait a minute, I've eaten a thousand worms in my life and none of them have ever moved like that worm. So maybe that's danger and they don't, they'll just let it go by. They'll wait for something else. So, anyways, I told them that, and I, then I walked them over to a hole, and I said, so you see the dark area under those trees? And my hatch is open. I said, see that dark area under the trees and in that hole right there? And she's like, yeah, that's where your trout will be. So you don't have to cast in the rapids. You don't have to cast where there's, you can see the bottom and the rocks. And the, Don't bother, because trout won't be there, ever, never. You can spend the rest of your life maybe you'll get one randomly i've seen trout in like random rapids and just hanging out in the shallow nowhere and i caught a few that way but for the most part you're not going to catch any fish just casting in an open air you have to find deep holes in structure structure they gotta have structure they need somewhere to hide um and that's because they're hiding to ambush things that come by whether it's a bug whether it's a worm whether it's another fish or bang and they have to have the perfect current that's the other thing people don't get trout have to have the perfect current they will not be where it's too fast they will not be where it's too slow they will not be where it's too shallow they will not be where it's too deep well they might be where it's too deep but they will they have to have the, the right current speed why it's because the current speed a if it's the right current speed they don't have to spend a ton of energy fighting the current which they don't want to do because that means they got to eat more so they got to just kind of relax but they also want it to go fast enough that it's bringing them food and bringing them oxygen. The faster water brings them oxygen so they can breathe faster. So it has to be perfect, fast enough so they can breathe good, slow enough to where, you know, they don't have to burn a lot of energy. So it's, you know, it's a balance. But once you figure it out and you understand how trout think and, and what they like, it's not that hard. You can kind of just, okay, that's a good trout spot. And usually nine times out of 10, if I want a good river where I know it hasn't been pounded by fishermen, I can walk up to a hole and look at it and go, okay, there's going to be a trout there. And almost on every first cast, just bang this trout every time. But, you know, most rivers aren't like that because they've been pounded by fishermen. And so if you're, if five other guys like me have been there before you, then, you know, trout probably isn't there or somebody's caught it or spooked it or caught it and let it go, whatever. Here we are at my spot. So I'm off to go to my next spot. I'm out. It's such a beautiful day. I want to uh, share it with you. This kind of what I do when I'm uh, soul searching, and excuse me, hole searching. Let me take this thing off here. This helps me see better. Um, I call it soul searching because I'm really hole searching. But so I haven't seen any fish yet because the river's real low. And so like I try to make these educational too. So I'm not just like, look at me, I got a fish or I'm out here or whatever. I want people to learn. So while I'm, what I'm using here, when I was just teaching these people at the other river how to trout fish and steelhead or giant rainbow trout, all trout are very smart. And they very, they see everything. Uh, they approach everything the same. They look for the same habitat. They look for the same um, food. So I learned over the years. I used to use a split shot, which is a little tiny sinker on your line to kind of hold it down lower and slow down the, the, the you know the, the presentation that's wrong you don't want to bother to hold it up none of that you just put a worm on there and let it float naturally in the current that's what you're after a natural float in the current it, because the trout notice like i said they they if, if the if the thing is bumping along and doesn't look right they'll they'll pass it by so trying to get just a worm casting with a worm with no weight is very hard trying to get it exactly where they like, see these fish because it's so shallow out here they're going to be pressed up in that bank so i'm almost sure somewhere under that bank over there is a steelhead or two or three or however many um but i literally have to get this worm 
within like inches of that bank. And there's a lot of brush hanging over the bank. So trying to get it over there without getting it caught in the brush is very difficult. But this is what I do. And my waders aren't leaking, so that's good. I patched them last night. This is not probably going to yield anything because I just can't cast it close enough to the bank because of all the brush. I'll just get snagged and I'll have two choices. Go over there and unpull it out or break my line, which I would probably un just go pull it out. But there's a lot of current here and it's not fun trying to blast your way through that current because there's a log jam right up there. I don't know if you can see it. There's a big log jam and it causes all the current to funnel together in like a five foot wide spot. So it's blasting. So if I got to cross the river into that, it's uh, not fun. Anyway, this is what I do. I'll find these little spots, riverbank holes. But really, my main approach is really this. I am going to go look for some beds. Because when I find beds with a fish on it, I know there's a fish there. And I know exactly how to put the bait right in front of the face. Um, that's it. So if there's a fish on a bed, if you can sneak up on it without exposing yourself or alerting the fish to your presence, if you throw a worm and it like goes right in their face, a lot of times they'll just they'll grab it out of instinct. Bang, grab it, and you got them. Um, sometimes they won't grab a worm, but they will grab spawn. Like last week, I cast out a like, hunk of spawn, an artificial spawn, and bang, he nailed it. So... That's what I'm doing. Now hopefully we can get a fish on. We'd be good to go. I'm out. Oh, I gotta say, it's so peaceful. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't think it's ate apple. It's so peaceful out here, man. Not seeing any fish, but that's okay. It don't matter, because the reward is just, the catch is being out here. It is beautiful. And that's where I caught them suckers the other day. <laughs> right here. Water's a lot more shallow and easier to see, cleaner. I uh, I just love being out here. I don't really care about the fish so much. It's such a beautiful day, man. It's so peaceful. I met some nice kid, you know, man, woman. They're not kids, but they're probably like 35. That's kind of like kids to me. And they were uh, never been up here, and they're just like, wow, it's so beautiful. This is paradise. I'm like, yeah. That's why I moved up here. And, uh, and I gave him a little fishing tutorial about what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. But, um, I mean, look at this, man. It's such a reward just to be out here. I'm so grateful. I'm grateful to God that I get to, get to do this. I want uh, take a break from work and just walk the river. You meet a few nice people. You never meet anybody who's a douchebag out here in the river, you know what I'm saying? They're always just, I mean, you know, usually a couple's are taking a hike or taking pictures, walking along, taking in the scenery. I heard some kids a few minutes ago somewhere screaming and yelling, little kids, but it's a Saturday afternoon. I uh, just enjoy my time with God and Looking for the fish. You know what I'm saying? It's so, it's warm. I can't believe how warm it is. It's such a nice bonus having dry feet. My, the two pairs of waders, they both leaked. I thought I was patching the other ones, but I was actually patching these ones. I think these got a high leak too. But anyways, I, I patched the toe on these because the other one's got a toe leak too. Because my boots wear out the... the the wading booties. Oh, I just saw fish jump. Just saw fish jump. Yeah, the boots wear out the wading booties in the same spot. Your big toe on both sets of my waders. But now it's so nice to have dry, warm feet. No, because you know, your feet get wet and the waders fill up with water. Like your leg gets heavy. You're you know struggling along, stumbling along because you got ten pounds of water in your boot, and uh, it's, it's it does affect how you walk and navigate and when you're in the river you're climbing over rocks and logs and trees and plus you're up and down the river banks trying to get in and out to avoid certain holes in the trees 
because you can't go through every hole. Some of them are too deep. Sometimes you got to cross the river. Anyways, when you got wet, well, there's a frog just jumped in. Kaboom. There he is, right there. And uh, it's just nice to have dry feet. That's all I'm saying. Could buy a new set of waders, but I'm at the point where, man, I brutalized them so bad that even brand new ones only last a couple of fishing trips, and they can start leaking. I just start patching them until I, until I can't patch them no more, and then I throw them out and buy new ones. They're not cheap. Good ones are about 150 bucks, 180 bucks. And I, I, I'm brutal on them because the type of fishing that I do is brutal. I'm crashing. This is actually easy type of navigating with some. When I'm brook trout fishing in the upper peninsula of Michigan, it's so dense you're just crashing through. You can't even, you're just crashing. There's, there's no trail, nothing. You're just breaking brush all the way through. And uh, oftentimes you got to climb over stuff and you get snagged. You know, your, your waders get snagged. I wiped out on my motorcycle a couple years ago ripped a big old hole in my waders I was going down a big ass hill this huge hill and I'd never been down it and it was a super heap steep hill and I said I can go down there because I didn't know how far the river was I didn't know if I had another mile to go or another quarter but the river's right at the bottom of the hill it was kind of suspected but I said I'm gonna go for it down on my, on my enduro dirt bike man I went down this hill I was going so fast that I locked up the brakes because I'm trying to slow down but what happens when you lock up your back brakes and you try to steer, I try to steer around like this log in the middle of the hill and you can't steer, you just keep going straight. So I had to let off the brake, which caused it to like to jump and I ended up like turning at the last second to avoid the log and I crashed into the woods and on the side of this big ass hill, halfway down. And so I had to like pick that freaking heavy ass bike up. I almost got killed by that bike one time. It fell over me on the side of a hill and pinned me down and for 20 minutes, I was pinned under my bike. And I was like, this has got to be, like, this is Twilight Zone, man. This ain't really happening. All my strength, everything I had, I'm a strong guy, I work out. Everything that I had, I could not get out from under that bike. It was pinned me. I was on the side of the hill, down in the weeds. Nobody could see me. There's just a dirt road in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I stopped to look at this river. Um, same river as this, but like 10 miles downstream from here. And when I went to put my kickstand down, it was all weeds on my, like on this side. I didn't realize how steep it was. So when I put the kickstand down, I went to sit, lean over to get off. There, there was no ground there. So I was just like, Whoa! and it fell on me and it pinned me down. And my foot was pinned by my foot peg. And I had waders on, but I had wading boots like this. These probably the same ones. And they were tied so tight that I couldn't pull myself out of them. So I'm literally stuck pinned. And I tried and tried for 20 minutes. It was like 85, 90 degrees. I'm hyperventilating. I'm going, my God, because blood's rushing to my head because I'm leaning down the hill. I'm starting to get lightheaded. I'm just like, this is where I caught this fish last week. And I'm like, this isn't really happening. This can't really be happening. Like, I'm legit in one of those emergency situations where I'm pinned under my motorcycle. Nobody's around. There's no signal. I'm in the middle of freaking nowhere. It's like 90 degrees. I had a leather coat on. It was super hot. I did. was able to wiggle out of that. And uh, so I kind of prayed. I said a prayer to God. I said, God, this can't be how I go out, man. You, you know, I don't know how long you could sit there pinned. My, my foot was going numb because it was like the blood flow was cut off. And I was just like, this can't be how it ends, man. Like, this can't really be happening. And uh, at one point I said to myself, gather up all your strength and give it one more try. And... Uh, so I gathered all my strength, but I had already done that like five times. So I'm just like, man, what's the point? And I don't know what I did differently, but I, I kicked my foot, my other leg up over and I pushed on the, on the handlebar as kind of twisted weirdly. And I'd already done that and didn't budge, but I tried it again. And I gave me just like one inch really quick. I felt it moving. I slipped my foot out a little bit and I slipped it down. So then I get up. And I'm standing there in shell shock, kind of like, what the frick just happened? Can't believe this really happened. And I'm on the side of the hill, but my bike slid down the hill about 10 feet when I fell over. And it's just high weeds and grass. So I'm kind of just standing up to my chest and weeds. And the like top of the hill is about neckline. And, uh, and the road was there. And some random dude pulls up, gets out of his car. He don't see me. And starts looking at the river. 
And I knew I wasn't going to be able to get my motorcycle back up the hill by myself. The thing's so heavy, man. It's like 350 pounds. It's just so heavy. It's built like a tank. That's why I still, you know, it's an older one and this thing's a beast. But it's just a tank, solid chunk of iron. And uh, I, I was like, how am I going to get this thing back up the hill? Like, you can't even get on it to drive it because you'll fall over. And uh, so I say, hey, man. And he flinches like, what the frick? He's like, man, where'd you come from? I said, man, I just fell over my bike. I was pinned. I got out. I'm out of breath, sweating. He's looking at me crazy. He turned out to be a bail bondsman, right? And he thought some 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 bikers were following him around to try and get him. And he thought I was one of them. He actually went in his car and grabbed his gun. He thought it was like an ambush or something. It was totally funny. But um, but I said, hey man, could you help me, dude? I like, could you help me push my bike back up? And he's super nervous. And even the two of us together, like, couldn't do it on our own. So I had to fire the bike up, put it in gear. And then we both pushed, and I kind of feathered the throttle with the gas one more moment and got it up the hill and got it. And then, you know, he, I told him who I was. He told me he's a bell bondsman. I'm like, oh, well, you're going to flip out when, you, when I tell you who I am or my story. And the whole time, he's like, I'm super nervous. Anyways, I became friends with a guy, and we ended up going camping the next week, trout fishing. <laughs> he's, like, really into trout fishing. Not, not really good at it, but he was learning. And I told him, let's go up to a spot that I think there's some trout. We'll find some, which is a funny story because he was a 35-year-old dude, and 34, I think. And I said, it's going to be brutal. It's going to be a lot of work. So prepare yourself. He's like, oh, God, I can handle anything. Da, 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 da. One of those guys. I said, all right, just know that it's going to be a lot of work and it won't be easy. But, you know, there should be some trout based on my research in the, in the, in the, the watershed, like the ecosystem, right? And he's like, yeah, whatever that means. And so we pull up this, we go Google Maps, find this creek. We drive 10 miles down some back roads and we find it. And I get out and I, I said, all right, you, I'm going to crash like 50 yards ahead. And then cut in, and you just get behind me like 30 yards and cut in, and then we'll just fit through. It's all grown over, so it's all like, it's called box alders. So these alders grow over the river, like this, these. But imagine these, but like five times thicker on both sides. So you see how thick it is, but it's like covering the whole river. But maybe, maybe three times more than that. And the river's half this size, so, and it's half as shallow. And so I start right away within freaking five minutes, I, I hook and land a big one, right? Because I yell, oh, I just missed one. I saw it come out. So I throw another worm down there, and bang, I hook it. I get it. He thinks I'm lying He's because he's never caught any big trout. I'm like, dude, that's got a big one. Big as a whale. He's 20 feet. Like, he starts crashing through the brush. He's 20 feet away from me. He can't see me. That's how dense it was, you know. He's like, I can't. Look near that tree. He can't see me. So I break through the brush towards him, and I show him. I got this big, fat brook trout in my hand. He's like, oh, my God, bro. That's freaking huge. I said, yeah, they're in here. I go back in. Five minutes later, I catch another one, like about a 10, 11 inch or another nice one. Not as big as that one, but a nice one. And uh, after about 10 minutes, I hear him go, hey, man, let's go to another river, man. This is too hard. I'm like, what? Too hard? Why would we go to another river? There's fish here. We just started. Like, we just literally showed up. I'm, I'm ready to go all day. I'm ready to crash this river for freaking five hours. Not joking. Legit, I'm ready for five hours of crashing this river. And he's 10 minutes in. He's like, man, this is too hard, bro. Da, da, da. I said, man, I thought you said you were a gladiator and you can handle it. He's like, man, no, nah, this is too much, bro. My, my back and this and that. He got all kinds of excuses. I'm like, you freaking pansy, bro. I said, all right. So there was another river closer by. And I took him to that river and he caught a little rainbow trout from like the, by the bridge. And he was super happy. I got a, I'm like, dude, you ain't cuffed for this, bro. The average guy ain't cuffed for this. I mean, I'm telling you. All these people who think, yeah, oh, I'll come fishing with you, or I'll, I, I can do that. I don't. No, you can't. You can't. It's just like the guy who says, I can bench 400 pounds, and you get him in the gym, and he can barely bench 185. It's one of those guys. It's just, you see this here? See how dense this is? Now, make it five times worse, and then crash you that for a mile. A legit mile. I'm 50 freaking one years old, man. This stuff is, I mean, you just have to be cut a certain way to do this. And by that, I mean, you just really want it. You just have to really want it. You just have to blast through all this stuff. And it's super physical. You're always getting scratched up. In the summer for trout, you're getting massacred by giant mosquitoes. And, and you're getting scratched and bruised. It's falling. Sometimes I fall. One time I fell super hard, like one of the hardest falls. I went down, wham! And when I fell, <clears throat> I fell and there was a beaver cut like this. See that? And I fell and I like landed. Like, had I not broken my fall, that spike would have went right through my chest. I mean, it was a boom. I fell hard. But if I wasn't able to block my fall, that thing would have stuck out the other side of me. 
And I came home and I told Maria, I was like, man, I fell down. I almost got skewered, right? And she's like, oh my God, don't tell me stuff like that. Don't tell me stuff like that. And then like a year later, I was out fishing two years ago at a spot and um, it's a brush. And I said, I'm going to go try to get to this river. It's about a mile. So you go for a walk, mushrooms, whatever. So I walk about 20 minutes and she starts hearing yelling. I hear the yelling. Somebody's going, ah, ah. She thinks it's me skewered on some spike or stake or broken leg or bleeding out by the river. So she tries to hit me on the radio and I forgot to turn the radio on. But the thing is, before I left, she says, you got the radio on? I said, yeah, 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 I got it. And I didn't, but I told her I did because I was just excited to go try to find this river. Because if I could have found the river, I was going to get some big trout. But I actually got all the way to the river, barring like 50 yards, because I had to use this red tape, this red marker tape. And you mark your trail about every 30, 40 yards. You tie a little red tape in the tree so you can see your trail. Well, I ran out before I got, I could see the river and I could see my trail, but if I go, I'm out of tape, but if I go to the river from here and go fish, great. But when I try to come back to find my trail out, I'll be lost and it's it, you're lost. It's just, I mean, we were like, I think we were legit like 18, 20 miles off the highway. So, I mean, we were in the middle of mother effing. That's a nice bed right there. No fish, but that's, that was, that's a fresh bed. This, the steelhead it's, was using it. It's either up there or it's up there, but I'm looking for an active spawner. And so she's yelling, gunny, gunny on the radio. She's running up and down the road trying to get a signal. Thinks I'm too far away from the walkie talkie radio. She's panicking. She's praying. She's going, oh my God, I'm losing my husband. How am I going to find him? Even if she's like, I'm going to go in there and find him. But then she's thinking, if I find him, how am I going to get him out? Like, she's just a girl. Like, I'm a 230-pound dude. How are you going to get me out of there? You're going to have to drag me a freaking half a mile out of the woods, mile out of the woods. And then, and then how are you going to do that? It's impossible. You're not, you're not a superwoman. And then, another frog. And then, uh, so she runs up and down the road trying to get a signal. No signal. She's thinking, should I drive 10 miles down the road trying to get, a, like, a cell phone signal so she can call 911? She said, but by then it might be too late. You know, maybe I need a tourniquet. Blah, blah, blah. And some yelling. She thinks it was a demon, which it could have been, just to terrorize her. And you hear some dude was like across the valley. See how you can see this? And if you look through above all this brush, you kind of see the tops of some pine trees way over there, right? About that far away, I hear some dude just going, ah, hey. In her mind, she heard, Maria, help. Maria, help. But I sat there going, what the frick is this guy yelling about, man? Look, like, what's his problem? Is some drunk dude? I and mean, we are in the middle of the wilderness. We, we are in the middle of nowhere. My theory on that is it was a, as a bear hunter. Uh, a lot of the bear guides, they bait, they bait bears. So what they do is they put, you know, food, old food from restaurants and crap out to bait piles called bait piles. And then somebody pays them a thousand bucks to shoot the bear. So they get bears, two, three, four bears come into the pile every night. And they, the guy says, give me a thousand bucks. I'll take you out this bear pile and you can shoot a bear, which is the biggest pussy thing I've ever heard. Like, dude, that's not hunting. That's just target shooting. That's just for guys with small dicks and Napoleon complex. Like you know, bears are basically have the disposition of a puppy. They're super non-intrusive. They don't bother anyone. They're not killers. They're not trying to attack anyone. They just want to live their life and be left alone, please. And they're super nice and docile and cute and curious. They don't bother nobody ever. You know, rare, once in a while, you tick one off or surprise one, you could have a problem, but for the most part. But anyways, my theory is that this dude uh, got treated by a bear. I think like, like maybe he was either had a bear like backing him up and he's going, ah, ah, trying to scare the bear off. Or maybe he ran up a tree or something. I don't know. That's still my only theory. But poor Maria thinks I'm dead out there. So I, since I can't get to the freaking river, I, uh, freaking muck, I give up. I go back, I untie all my red tapes, and I start heading back. So when I'm about halfway back, about 20 minutes, I check my radio. I realize I didn't turn it on. I click it on. I'm like, I'm like, Birdie, because I call her Birdie. I said, Birdie. She goes, oh, my God, where are you? He said, what, calm down, what's the problem? He goes, I heard you yelling. I'm like, oh, yeah, no, that wasn't me. I don't know who that was. So I'm freaking douchebag. He's out here yelling. I have no idea why or who or why. She says, oh, my God, I thought you were dead. I thought you had no idea. I was right. And she, she's thinking to herself, every sin, this is what she thought, every sin that she'd ever committed in her life, she was, she was now paying for it. 
that's what she was thinking. God, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. I'm so sorry what I do. Da, da, da. And I just come like walking up. I said, no, I'm on my way out. I'll be there in a minute. I had no idea that she, for the last 20 minutes, she'd been running around. She ran like a freaking half a mile, quarter mile both ways. And just trying to get a signal, yelling, Gunny, you there? Gunny, you there? And all these horrible things going through her mind, thinking that I'm, uh, I'm dead or suffering or skewered or whatever. Speaking of beaver, I showed this tree the other day. Look at this freaking beaver cut down this tree. I mean, and then he just went head. I mean, he just went ham on this mother effer. Yum, 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 yum. He started on the bark, and then said, hey, at this particular spot, he goes, hmm, this is a nice tender pump chunk. I'll eat some there. And then I'll eat some there. And then I'll eat some here. And look, he just, he really liked this part of the smorgasbord. He, he's, this is his freaking jam right here. And then he cut down some more trees over there and did the same. Funny, man. No joke. A lot of people don't realize, like, how... You know, when they talk about beavers cutting trees down, they don't realize that they legit cut trees down like big ass trees. This freaking beaver cut a freaking cut this tree down with his teeth. The whole tree. That one too. Another one over there, and another one over there, and another one over there. He's been eating it. He likes these. These are popple trees. That's what they typically eat. Um, sometimes they eat pine. The other day I found one where they were eating apple bark off the apple tree. Like I just did a little lunch took a break to have a little snack. I mean, think about that. Animal that eats wood. It's the most bizarre thing if you think about it. Think about it. An animal that eats wood. That's what he digests. That's where he derives his nutrients. It makes you wonder, man. Like, if you were starving, could you eat wood? I mean, clearly it has nutritional value. I just don't think humans can metabolize it. I, I don't think it's possible. Maybe a little bit. I think we could eat grass, some of these weeds and crap. And I would if like, I was starving. That's where I one time caught a Moby Dick fish in there. Never did land them, that's a whole nother story. But um, I think you'd eat weeds and leaves and crap, but it wouldn't give you a whole lot of nutrients. Anybody who knows the story about that plane that crashed in the, the Andes for the soccer team, okay. Uh, Argentine, and, Argentine soccer team uh, the plane crashed in the Alps, and they, 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 it was just a soccer team. Everybody, half the people were dead. So they sat there for three, four, five days, starving. Eventually, this is a true story. You can look it up. They started eating the dead bodies that were frozen, you know. They started eating dead bodies, and they just, to survive, they had no other way. To, one of them said, hey, man, we got to eat Bobby, man, or whatever. I'm starting on the rump. I mean, if we're going to live, we need nutrients. So they started eating. So I think it was two of them decided we're going to walk out of here. So it was for like 40 miles through the mountains. Nobody knew where the plane was. This is before like GPS and stuff was everywhere. And uh, nobody knew where the plane crashed. They knew it crashed into Andy somewhere. But they didn't know exactly where. And you're know, talking thousands of square miles. So they had no idea. It was just on the side of a mountain in the mountains. Like just, just rolling mountains for miles, hundreds of miles. So, these two dudes, God bless them, these two gangsters, man. They took as much clothes and stuff as they could and packed a bunch of dead body meat, raw meat. I don't even think they, co they, they cooked it. Pretty sure they didn't even have fire. And they slept on the side of mountains. And these mother effers hiked 40 miles over the mountains and hiked out of there. And then finally, after like 40 miles, the mountain gave way to like a valley that had like grass and stuff. That's what made me think of this. And they like just got on their hands and knees and started eating grass. They were so happy just to have some grass. And uh, this is a tough spot to navigate. You gotta, you gotta just crash it. Uh, of course, your fishing line gets tapped. Just get caught in everything. So yeah, and what ended up, ended up happening is these guys are like sitting there mowing on grass by this creek and some ar farmer, like Argentine farmer, Venezuelan farmer, I can't remember, one of those South American countries, uh, comes pulling up on a donkey and was like, 
yo, what the frick, you guys are all right? And they were like, oh, my God. You know, they told him who it was. And the guy knew. He's like, he heard of it. You know, he's like, oh, my God, you're one of the survivors of that plane crash. And uh, and so the line is all screwed up. Man. I'm just going to make sure I don't lose all my line. And so um, they ate the dead bodies. They made a movie out of them. They made a movie out of that whole story about these guys who freaking ate dead bodies and hiked out of there. can't remember the name of the movie, but this stuff is dangerous. See this? This is another part of crashing. It looks like it's stable, but oftentimes you step on it with a frog. See the frog right there? And you'll, you'll, you know, so you get stuck in it, man. You step into it and you go up to your waist and then you're stuck and you can't get out. That's often happens and it's not fun because you got to pull your boot off to get out. And then you got to get on your hands and knees and pull your boot out. That's if you can even get out. There have been times like I had to just fall down and relax. It's, it's quicksand. That's what people call quicksand. That's a form of it anyways. And uh, <clears throat> anyways, that's the story of the guys in the Andes eating grass to survive. And I just remember them saying, they were so happy to have some grass. Just get on the ground and eat grass. Because it had some kind of nutrients and it wasn't dead body. I really should put a worm back on here and float my broke my worm my hook off. I got snagged. And uh, look at that grassy knoll right there. Isn't that where Kennedy got shot? A big ass hill. And then there's that. I don't know why it's all perfect grass. Usually it'd be grown over with these uh alders, who knows? I don't know the ecosystem, but I know this. I got to get back to fishing. I'm just saying. Got one. Got a nice, nice little, I got a little rainbow on here. Nice little rainbow. It's going to be dinner. Been fighting it for a minute. Uh-oh. Get out of the logs. Yeah. Nice fish. Got on the worm. Nice little rainbow. That might be a brookie. No, it's a rainbow. Swallow the hook, so this is going to be dinner. Beautiful little rain. About a 14-inch rainbow. Nice. There's some guy who's been talking to you for the last 10 minutes. Nice little rainbow. Beautiful. It's going to be my dinner. The last rainbow I caught this size in here was uh, delicious. So let's pull her up. Him up. Too bad it wasn't a nice big steelhead. Beautiful fish though. Get him, eat him. Eh? We in there now. Nice pan fry rainbow. This is gonna be dinner. I'll cut it up, I'll cut the head off, gut it, bring it back and fry it up in some bacon grease. It's a good day. I even saw the lights of the Goodyear blimp that said LLU pimp. Huh? You gotta do a video about black flies. Black flies matter. Every year I do a video like that. And because they come out for like two weeks every year, black flies. And they're the worst. They bite the crap out of you. Maria's allergic to them. So when she gets bit, they leave like a welt, like a cigarette burn, like somebody burnt her with a cigarette. So she can't, and like off, DEET will keep them off you to a degree. And she won't wear DEET. She's like, I don't wear the chemical. I'm like, whatever then, get eaten up. I'm wearing some DEET. But they're out right now on full force. And they bit the crap out of my ears. It's late. I heard somebody and there's a, somebody walking a dog. Like, what the frick? I know I heard man-made sound as a dog's leash. And that freaked me out because I'm way back here. But uh, it's late. But I know where a couple of steelhead were on their beds last week. And I ran into a guy who's been fishing up and down the river with his buddy. Some old-timer. Been fishing here for 50 years, 40 years. Comes here every year. 
pestering all the fish, chasing them around. And then more power to him. He has every right to do that. I mean, the public river. Oh, what was that, duck? But, um, you know, that's one of the reasons why I'm not seeing many fish. Because guys who don't know what the frick they're doing, they're running around throwing daredevils at them and shad wraps and all this big old clunky lures that go kaboosh, splash. And, uh, I think I might see a fish. Is that a fish or is that a log? I do have... I do have, uh... Dude, I think... Is that a fish? No, it's a log. I was say, man, that is a fish. I do have leaks in my waders, but I figure out where they are, so no big deal. I can patch them up. Not bad, either. I knew there was a couple leaks in this thing. They're not terrible, so I'm not soaked and freezing. This is that quicksand I told you about. You gotta watch where you step in it. Oh, oh, see, look at that, how deep I went. It's almost up to my knee. Look at that. Uh, this is the... Look at this um, human sighting. It's weird, you don't see anyone back here. It's some chick walking her dog. Or dude, I can't even tell anymore. Could be anything. Could be a yeah, he, she. Stupidest thing I've ever heard. I'm a he, she, just to, If they even knew how insane they sounded, this generation, when they start talking about, these are my pronouns, he, she's, and it is what, like, if we could go back in time, just a, 50 years, and, and tell people, this is what our youth is going to be like. They don't know if they're a boy or a girl. They can't divine a man or a woman. They want to be called he, she's, or it. They have no idea what they are. They won't work because they're lazy and coddled. And if they go to work and show up late and start getting yelled at, all they got to do is go, why are you yelling at me? I'm gay. And then the boss has to go, oh, okay, well, never mind. My bad. Because, you know, God forbid, all I got to say is that you're, you're homophobic. And there you go. You're going to lose your company. It's just the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I mean, it is literally comedy, an SNL skit, the whole our whole society, and it started in the United States, and it just spread outwards from there, uh, you know, to, of course, the UK, they do everything that we do, they just jock us, whatever we do, we, we put a bullet, a gun to our head and pull the trigger, they go, oh, that's cool, we'll do that too, and Australia does the same thing, Canada, Canada, just tries to take whatever we do, in terms of wokeness, and do it even better, and no matter what, they're people, like, 75% like of the people are like, yo, this is insane. They're like, we don't care. Shut up. We're doing whatever we want. And uh, we're woke. So shut up. And it's just insanity. That's the world we live in. You know, if we walk along, I, I see a dude with long hair or a chick with short hair. I, I don't even know what the frick they are anymore. This is what it is. Crazy world. This is a good hole. I, should, I gotta at least throw a worm through it. Because I know... Those spawning fish were on the other side over there. So I'm going to go see if they're still there. Hopefully I don't kill myself getting down this hill. Well, we are in the enchanted forest. A freaking black fly just flew into my ear. Mother... They're just attacking me brutally, man. Just, all I hear is... They're bouncing off my face, biting me. My one boot is filled up with water. Because it did leak pretty bad when I got in some deep water. Uh, this kind of forest is spooky right now. You know it's time to go when you hear a thunderstorm coming. Plus, it's going to be dark in about 20 minutes. The, the camera phone, iPhone, always does a good job of lightening it up, so it looks like it's late. But it's not. It's pretty dark. And I'm about two miles from the car, and I hear a thunderstorm. You can hear it in the background. I didn't see a single steelhead today. I had to catch a rainbow trout. My shoulder burns. I did shoulders a couple days ago. This is where I saw some steelhead a couple days, last, well, a week ago. They're gone, though. I had this conversation 
with this dude I met, right? Old dude. I don't know, probably 60. But, you know, I'm getting there. Getting there, my darn self. Well, I gotta keep my hand out of this frame. And uh, he could been coming here for like 40 years. I've never seen him. I've been fishing here for seven years all the time. So he probably don't fish that much. A talker. One of them guys like to talk, hear himself talk, which is cool. I'm the same kind of way. But uh, he's also one of those guys who talk about fishing more than he actually does fishing. Like, he's got a lifetime of fishing stories. And every time he meets somebody, he wants to tell them all these highlights. I can't even begin to even, you know, I can't even begin to get into the highlights of my fishing. I could be here for a freaking month. So I usually just like, yeah, I've caught a few nice ones here and there or whatever. I don't really get specific, but this guy wouldn't shut up. He was just telling me specific story after story about this guy and that guy. Or him. And like, it's nice. One thing we both agreed upon is we hate people. And there are places in Michigan. I mean, Michigan is a fishing capital of North America besides maybe Alaska. And even then. And the thing is, there are, there are rivers I can go fish on the west side of the state that are just freaking loaded with fish. Oh no, it's starting to rain. Son of a putana. I gotta get moving. And, uh, but the problem is they're loaded with fish, but they're loaded with people. Freaking people everywhere. And, and I don't wanna be around people. Hey, freaking black flies, get out of my ears, man. Jeez. I don't want to be around people all day. You know, I've almost gotten fights on the river. I get stuck in every branch. I've had do drunken douchebag idiots get tough. Not really tough, but had a couple incidents. One time, I was at the Tippy Dam. There's about 20 guys all lined up by the dam. I'm the first number one like right up as close as you can get because yes i did debo my way up i basically walked up and said excuse me man and just muscled my way into the best spot which is a douchebag thing to do with yeah, i was you know like 25 years old didn't care like let somebody say something so i start snagging salmon i'm catching i'm hooking them every five minutes because i'm snagging illegally right so every time i hook a fish i yell fish on see all the other guys would reel in the lines and we wouldn't get tangled now, the river's big and wide and deep. You know, it's like 30 yards wide or something. So that's deeper and wider than freaking you know, Kim Kardashian, I guess. Uh, so I hook a few, like three fish. And the same douchebag dude on the other side of the river. And it's too deep to actually get to him. Like wade over there and slap him. So I'll say nothing. It's really weird fishing when you're in that environment. Everybody whispers. So it's super quiet. I guess everybody likes to the, enjoy the nature and the river and solitude and tranquility. So if you're with your boy, you're like, hey, man, hey, me that, hey, me that fishing rod or whatever. Get the net. So it's quiet. And this guy snags my fish, hooks my fish. And like twice my fi the fish gets off. The third time he lands my fish. So my fish gets wrapped up in his line. His line is stronger than mine. And he breaks my line. And gets my fish. So I, I'm like, I don't like to curse. But I'll say, hey, mother effer. You do that again, I'm going to jump in my Jeep, drive over there and beat your brains out. Exact words. I'm going to get in my Jeep, come over there and beat your brains out. Do that one more time. But I said it loud, you know what I mean? I just said it like, yell, motherfucker, do that again. I'll come over there and beat your mother effing brains out. I know what you're doing. He don't say nothing. He just kind of like, he actually subconsciously backed up. I freaking bugs in my face, even though I couldn't get to him because I'm on the other side of the river. And so the irony of that was I ended up catching, I think three fish, landed them right there, right? But I'm snagging and this is early cell phone technology time. So some people did have cell phones and, uh, and I had a feeling some people had called the DNR on me to tell, you know, say I was snagging. And I was like, I don't care. So, like, 45 minutes in, after I threatened to beat this guy's brains out, I said, I'm going to take a break. Because I have a feeling the DNR might be here watching. That's my theory. 
So I take a break and I let these other guys move up into the spot where I was, which is the best spot. I was cool with them. Like, you guys move up here and you can have that spot. I'm just going to chill for a few. So they get the freaking, the casting under this wire, this cable, and you're not supposed to be up in there. Actually, you can cast up in there, but they went under it. They had waders on. They waded up under this cable and they were, it was illegal. And all of a sudden, there's like a hill behind me that goes up and there's a fence. And all of a sudden, I hear, you, you, and you, come here, give me your license. I look up, and there's a woman, DNR officer. And uh, that's a funny story. And she's freaking, and I'm thinking, man, I could be busted here. Because if she was watching me up, up until like 10 minutes ago, and I've been busted, at, I've been busted kind of in a similar way. A foot dam on the Savo River years earlier with these black dudes, which is a hilarious story. You should look it up on my YouTube if you watch this. Snag and salmon uh, got me busted. These two black dudes, I got them tickets. But, um, so she don't say nothing to me though. I'm waiting for her to go, you and give me your license. You know, I watch you with snag and you know, so I just say, hell with it. She's giving these guys tickets and her back is to me. So I put this big spinner on, this gigantic MEP spinner used for, for musky. I think I got it from my grandfather. It's got a huge trouble hook on it, right? So even though it's a legal, uh, you know, it's a legal rig, it's got this big snagging hook on it too. So I'm cat, well, she's got her back to me, and I got my kind of back to her. When she ain't looking, I'm just trying to snag. And guys are looking at me, kind of laughing, like, this motherfucker's got balls, man. Like DNR is right there with her back to this dude, and I'm, and I'm snagging, trying to snag salmon. All of a sudden, bang! I hook into one. I'm like, fish on. The chick turns around, she's like, what's going on? I'm like, the rod's doubled over. This fish is jumping. It's like kind of shocked right there. And it was a big female hen, and she pooped out after like maybe a minute or two, which I was kind of surprised because it was such a big fish. And the reason for that is. When she bit down, she actually bit the spinner. She wasn't snagged. She just smashed that spinner. And she, when she bit down on it, all three trebles uh, hooked into her mouth. And what happened? What the frick is that? Coyote? Ducks? Um, all three trebles locked in her mouth. And what happened was it locked her jaw shut. So that her lower jaw couldn't open to breathe in water so she could breathe air. So basically, she pooped out really fast because she couldn't breathe. So after like a minute or so, she just kind of came in. This big fresh salmon that was like 25 pounds. I was like, why is this thing in fight good? And I looked at it. And she had a freaking, it was just the way she bit down perfectly on it. It like locked her jaw shut. And she couldn't get her jaw open so she couldn't breathe. And it was, uh, hear that thunder coming? I got to outrun the thunder. I probably won't do it. Look at this blue sky right there. But over there is a freaking thunderstorm marching my way. Anyway, that was my day. Out here on the river doing what I do. I got a freaking bug in my ear, man. Driving me nuts. It just keeps flying into my ear. Biting my face. This ain't going to be pleasant when I, if I get this freaking hammering in this thunderstorm. At least it's warm. Now, I've, I've been in a situation like this when it's been cool, at least, not cold be cool and uh, that's never pleasant two years in a row this same river i drove my motorcycle based on weather reports from my wife she said oh yeah it's a beautiful day you're gonna be good sunny all day jump on my motorcycle gear up drive 40 miles 50 miles whatever it is pull up start walking to the river and it starts downpouring Ruins my day. I fish for five minutes. I do catch a nice brook trout. And then I just turn around. I'm soaked to the bone. My waders are filled with water. The day's ruined. Next year, come back. Same thing. Honey, same weather report. Same spot. Same identical scenario. Identical. Same time of year. I pull up. Get my gear ready. Grab my worms. My rod off my motorcycle. Start marching towards the river. And freaking bug in my ear, man. And it starts downpouring. And it's not warm. Same thing, ruins my day. I'm totally, then I gotta drive out of there and everything's flooded, man. Like the trail's like a river. And I gotta go miles on this like tra trail. It's just flooded, swamped out on my motorcycle. 
literally there are times where like I almost swamped it out. I'm in two feet of water, going through the water. Uh, but my my bike, it's a Suzuki 350. I can't remember the name. It's the the, the, the like e, EM or DM or something like that, something like that. But it's it's a friggin' beast, and I'd buy another one in a minute. The monster. Here comes the rain. Here. When I first got out of prison, I used to come here to walk with Maria. And you, if you can see that big hill over there, it's about, I don't know, 60, 60, 70, 60 yards high. And it's almost straight up. I used to run up and down that hill for fun. Just to, you know, for exercise. Damn it, I'm in bad shape here, man. I'm out here. I still got an easy mile and it's starting to pour. This is not good. Maybe a little squall will blow over. Oh, I wasn't that smart. I didn't time this good. I should have left 20 minutes ago. If I had left 20 minutes ago, I'd be at my car right now. Uh oh, it's lightening up. Maybe I, I beat him. Probably not. We're back at the beaver tree. See, there's the beaver tree. That sounds like something perverse. Like the freaking the name of a porno or something. Beaver tree. Oh, that guy. There's that guy over there. The guy's over there, man. He's still over there fishing. Good for him. The old, like, 60-year-old dude does more freaking talking than he does fishing. He's just stalking along, looking for fish, doing the same thing I did. I do. Good for him. That's good, man. You know, guy gets out and goes fishing. Not too many people do it these days. And sadly, everybody wants to sit there and watch YouTube or TikTok or Instagram or video games or Netflix. It's a digital world. I mean, they're so good at recreating the world. Like, I'll post this video and people will be like, well, I want to go fishing today. Just with Gunner. I'm going to sit on my couch and, you know, smoke a blunt. meet much out and watch Gunner. He's doing that thing. No. No. Don't do that. I implore. Get off your frickin' couch. Forget me. And get out here, man. Experience. You'll have a story to tell. I smell a porcupine. You can always smell a porcupine den. It smells like a porcupine. There's one around here somewhere. It smells good. It smells, it smells awesome. Man, if you could can that smell, you'd be frickin' paid. I do remember when I was in prison, I was in these prisons downstate. Then I went to the prison in Detroit called Ryan Road. I was there for seven months, got into it with the, uh, the warden, well, the deputy warden. He told me I gotta discontinue my Facebook. Why? Because I was getting fan mail. Why? My cousin posted sample chapters of my book on Facebook and these random people that I never heard of started writing me fan mail going, dude, you're the truth at this writing row. Oh man, here it comes. Yeah, the wind is not bad. I blow the freaking flies away from me, man. Bring on the flies. But, uh, so yeah, the deputy warden says, what's all this fan mail? I said, my friend and my cousin started a Facebook. You can't have a Facebook. I'm like, really? Is there a, a policy or a law that says that? No. But you got to just, you want to get a parole? I said, yeah. He's like, well, you better turn off your Facebook. I said, well, I'm not doing it. So basically, yeah, few. Look at this big popple tree that fell over. There's a bug in my ear. It's driving me nuts. Uh, it's in my ear, man. It's going, bzz, bzz, bzz. Oh, I killed it. Look at that popple tree that fell over, man. That is a massive, massive tree. And then it, 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 well, it, oh, it knocked over that tree. So this big giant tree fell over and smashed and knocked down that giant tree over there. There was a windstorm a couple weeks ago, really bad. Look at that, man. And it fell right between those birch trees. Two massive trees. This is a widow maker right here. This thing falls over. And dum, da dum, dum, dum. It's a big pine tree. There's another tree that cracked, broke, blew off over there, man. The wind's been devastating the last few weeks and it's taking down a lot of trees anyways what was I talking about 
fish, man. Get outside and fish. I'm still looking for fish, man. If I see a fish, I'm staying. I literally will stay right here in the rain and fish. I don't give it ish if it rains. Oh, yeah, I was saying how when I was in Ryan Road Prison, there was a couple fish here last week. This is where I caught my one last week, right down there. When I was in Ryan Road Prison, it was the ghetto. I was in Detroit, the Detroit ghetto, and it stunk like ghetto because it was the ghetto. And uh, actually, this is where the fish was last week. And then when I got into it, the warden, they told me, you got to discontinue this Facebook page. And I'm like, or what? And he says, how many years you got left? I'm like, five and a half. He's like, you plan on going home? I'm like, of course I plan on going home. And he says, well, you better discontinue it. And I said, well, I'm not. So three days later, they wrote me to the worst prison in, in North America. Okay, we got, we, got, we got a couple right here. Right here, I got to get the fishing, you guys. I don't know if you can see them, but there's two or three nice fish in there. There's one right there. But you can see the tail a little bit. There's one, there's one closer. I think there's uh, four fish in there. You can't see them because of the glare, which is probably good. It'll help me slip down there. We'll see. Let's see what I can do. Just to show you what a gangster I am, I'm fishing in the rain. There's like five steelhead right in this hole right there. And it's downpouring and thunderstorm. Think I'm leaving? <laughs> nope, I'm here. Saying. So I didn't get those fish. Couldn't I mean I just it was too hard to angle standing on the side of the bank shoreline and it was downpouring and my glasses were all wet so I couldn't see. Without Polaroid's glasses, you can't see into the water. So I can't see where the fish are. The rain is co is covering them up. So I'm still walking along, heading back, and just now I fall. I'm coming down the slight you know decline here and my line gets hooked on this thing right here and i at the same time my feet slip out from under me and i'm like whoop, 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 slip and bang, bang and bang and i go down and now it's pouring rain again this is the end of my day but i gotta tell you it does be prison i'm just saying things could be worse I'm a little bummed out because the river's down there and i'm trying to listen to this flute bird i hope you can hear it my favorite birds ever. You hear it? Listen. It's right up there. Nope. That was one here. He's a little nervous. I can't see him, but he's there. I lost him. There he goes, right there. There he goes. That's it, flute bear. He's over there, sounding off now. Oh, I love nature. Love it. This is my jam. This is my jam. Flute birds calling all around me. When I first got out of prison, I was driving my foiler down this trail down this big ass sandy trail here and I ran out of gas and I had to call Maria <laughs> to come bring me gas and I had to walk like a mile like a dumbass I forgot to put gas in my four wheeler before I headed off on an adventure and I get out here and I had to walk about a mile before I even got signal and I'm like honey can you bring me gas to you know where she knows where and so she drove here and saved me. It was funny. Surrounded by God's beauty, man. I might call the DNR and ask them if I can come chop up this tree for firewood. Why not? Clean up the trail. Look at these beautiful trails, man. Where I live. I met people today. They live in the city. And you're like, dude, you live in paradise. I said, yes, I do. That's why I live here. Given the choice to live anywhere in the world, I would live here or the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. The problem is the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, uh, the winters are like an extra two weeks, three weeks longer, and the fall is shorter, and you get a ton more snow. So I'm like, this is kind of the 
perfect place. Winters are long, but the spring, summer, and falls are just mind-blowing spectacular. Look at this place, man. This is the uh, access place, the park. Not a single soul here. Saturday evening, 70 degrees. Yes, it just rained. I'm soaking wet and I'm perfectly comfortable. Walking out of here, listening to the flute birds. I can still hear them calling behind me. Flute birds, hermit thrush. I'm the only car here. Hey, this is my backyard. I love life. God has blessed me so abundantly. All I can do is thank God every day that I'm able to do this, man. I'm still fit and svelte enough to get out and enjoy my life. Come on up, friends of mine. You know who you are. You know where I am. Come on up. Let's do this. This is a campground a half a mile from here on the river. Let's camp it out. Nug. Oh, oh, oh.